In this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, we take up, is there no truth in beauty? Compliance, the final frontier. Tom Fox is the voyager of Trekking Through Compliance. His mission, to explore the original series and seek out and share what it can teach you about compliance. Here's your host, Tom Fox. Trekking Through Compliance, Episode 60, Is There No Truth in Beauty? In this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, we consider the episode, Is There No Truth in Beauty?, which aired on October 18th, 1968, and occurred on Stardate 5630.7. Story synopsis. The Enterprise is given the mission of transporting the Medusan ambassador Kolos, a member of his species so ugly that the mere sight of it causes humans to go insane, back to his home planet. Spock is able to wear a visor which will protect him, but all humans are forced to leave the bridge when the ambassador arrives. The ambassador arrives enclosed in a specially designated box, but he's also accompanied by the telepath Dr. Miranda Jones, who is looking after his special needs. Like Spock, Jones is able to look at the Medusan through a visor, supposedly because she has studied on Vulcan. Larry Marvick, one of the designers of the Enterprise, has also beamed aboard. He is in love with Dr. Jones. At the welcoming dinner, the senior crew all drool over uh, Miranda Jones, but the mood is spoiled when she reports that someone nearby is contemplating murder. When Marvick's advances are snubbed by Dr. Jones, she discovers that he is the one considering murder, although she does not know against whom. Marvick seeks revenge against Kolos by taking Miranda away from him, but is driven insane when he inadvertently looks at Kolos while attempting to shoot him with a phaser. The insane Marvick commandeers the Enterprise and pilots it to an unknown location outside the galaxy and raves about being suffocated in his sleep, then dies for no apparent reason. In order to return the uh, the Enterprise to our galaxy, or its galaxy, I should say, uh, either Spock or Jones must mind meld with the ambassador who, as with all Medusans, is a master navigator. Spock is given the task but fears interference from Dr. Jones. He was fiercely jealous of Spock's ability to mind meld with the Medusan. Kirk dis- discovers that or Dr. Jones is afraid of human emotion and wishes to go with Kolos partly to avoid having to deal with it. However, she learns of Spock's plan telepathically and demands that she be taught to pilot the Enterprise so that she can mind meld with Kolos. Bones uses the opportunity to reveal with that Miranda is blind as her dress is a highly complicated sensor array which allows her to see as well as measure Kirk's distance from the doors that they are nearby, which is why she's able to look at Kolos. Kirk suggests that Miranda take up the issue with Kolos, who agrees to her horror that Spock should be the one to make contact. Using the visor to protect his human half from the sight of the Medusan, Spock mind melts. Now, smiling and cheerful, Spock greets the other senior members of the crew, uh, then pilots the ship successfully back to our home galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. However, when Spock reverses his mind meld and forgets the visor, he sees Kolos and goes insane. Kirk asks Miranda to help Spock, and she claims, uh, and she claims she can do nothing. Kirk accuses her of having used her mental powers to make Spock forget to put on the visor. Luckily, Miranda has a change of heart and uses telepathy to bring Spock back to health. Miranda and Kolos are then delivered to their destinations. Upon parting, Kirk presents Dr. Jones with a rose. Miranda queries, I suppose it has thorns. And Kirk responds, I never met a rose that didn't. So what is the fun fact from this episode? Well, At the dinner honoring Ambassador Kolos and Dr. Jones, Spock wore the honorary Vulcan medallion, the Idic. Now, the Idic was created by Gene Roddenberry so that he would have Star Trek merchandise to sell. So this was uh, way before uh, the current craze of merchandising as the way to make more money than the movie started, largely around Star Wars, yet Gene Roddenberry wanted to do it. Uh, the actors involved, uh, Leonard Nimoy, Bill Shatner, and the others were outraged at this, and Roddenberry was called to the set to negotiate with the actors. Finally, he agreed to rewrite the dinner scene, and although the Idic symbol was used, it was much uh, less prominently portrayed. Still, the Idic has become iconic within the greater TOS 
There are lots of references to Shakespeare in Star Trek, the original series, and there are several in this episode. Miranda was the name of Prospero's virginal daughter in The Temptress. Spock, Kolos, and Miranda also reference the play when Kolos sees Miranda for the first time through humanoid eyes. Oh, brave new world that has such creatures in it, to which Miranda answers, "'Tis new to thee." Spock and Kolo say such creatures, a common misquotation as a play's line actually read, such people. The episode title was from a poem by a 17th century English poet and clergyman named George Herbert from his poem, Jordan. And the line which reads, Who says that fictions only and false hair become a verse? Is there no truth in beauty? The episode script Uh, was an unsolicited script, which uh, producer Bob Justman read and recommended. So, uh, really interesting episode. I really enjoyed it. Some great science fiction. And I hope you will uh, check out uh, this episode of Star Trek, the original series. Universe. So, what are the compliance takeaways from this episode? Well, first of all, um, Miranda Jones... She is ready to get going. Uh, she's literally ran it, ready to hit the ground running. So I would challenge you, if you're a new CCO or in a new compliance position, uh, how are you going to hit the ground running in your first 100 days? Do you have a game plan? Do you have a uh, one-month, six-month, or one-month, three-month, six-month, one-year, 18-month, 24-month plan of what you're going to do? Uh, I would suggest you do that. If you would like information on that, I put a couple of those together, so give me a shout. But... Uh, you've got to hit the ground running as a new compliance officer. Second, do you use design thinking in compliance? Well, uh, you should use design thinking. Uh, this approach, uh, while primarily used in product design, is now infusing corporate culture, and I found it to be particularly uh, applicable to the compliance perspective because design thinking is is focus is designed to focus your thinking as the designer on the user's experience. If you can increase the user's experience of compliance, I think you will have a much more robust uh, compliance program going forward. So uh, study design thinking, figure out how to use it, and then incorporate that into uh, your project management skills for compliance. And then finally, although this series is about uh, Star Trek, the original series, and I'm not really using this as a pun on, on words, but a chief compliance officer must be an enterprise leader. I don't mean a William Shatner uh, leader of the enterprise, but there are six components of a mindset of a successful leader, heightened sense of place, a broad sense of context, a sharp sense of perspective, powerful sense of community, a deep sense of purpose, and abiding sense of resiliency. Uh, By using these six components, you as a compliance practitioner, I think, can really up your game, uh, certainly corporate-wide. So uh, as a compliance professional or a CCO, you should try and strive to be a enterprise leader, no pun intended. I hope you'll join me tomorrow for Trekking in Compliance, where we have one of my all-time favorites, the specter of the gun. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, you can help it grow by sharing it with the biggest Trek fan you know. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.